All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight, tonight, we're going to read a very, very fun sutta tonight. So tonight, we're going to be looking at uh, a sutta also from the Majjhima Nikaya, the Middle Length Discourses. We're moving on to sutta number 56. This is the Upali Sutta. Um, it's kind of a long sutta. It's it's not. It's not too long, but it's a it's a good length. So we're gonna kind of dive right in. Um if uh if you didn't hear, I'm not gonna be here next week. So I'm going to try not to make this a part one, part two, because it'll be so long before we get back to the part two. So let's try and make our way through the sutta. Actually, we kind of need to make it all the way through the sutta because it there's so much going on that if we don't get all the way through it, it kind of will miss it. So uh, a couple of things to start. So this is called the Upali Sutta, and Upali is a person. Upali is a gahapati, a householder. Now, if you've studied Buddhism before, though, the name Upali might ring bells, but that's not this Upali. So there's a very famous Buddhist monk, a, a Tara, an elder, named Upali. And he was a barber. He was actually the Buddha's barber before he converted and became a monk. And then he rose to become the foremost monk, like the foremost observer of rules. But that's not who we're talking about tonight. Tonight, we're talking about the householder Upali. And this is, I, I, this is such a fun sutta. It's fun though, not exactly because of what, like the topic, the topic is interesting, but the it's the story tonight. This sutta, this is practically a movie. It's gonna be a movie tonight is what I'm saying. So everybody get ready. Uh, again, we're gonna dive right in. I have a kind of a lot to mention at the beginning in order to kind of set the scene or to create a good setting. And then we're just gonna kind of start moving right through it. So the first thing, uh, once again, it's Sutta number 56 in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Upali Sutta. And it begins like every single sutra begins, thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Nalanda in Havarika's Mango Grove. Now, on that occasion, the Nagantaha Nataputta was staying at Nalanda with a large assembly of Nigantahas. Then, when the Nigantaha named Dika Tapasi had wandered for alms in Nalanda and had returned from his alms round. After his meal, he went to the to Paravarka, Paravika's mango grove to see the Blessed One. He exchanged greetings with the Blessed One. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood at one side. As he stood there, the Blessed One said to him, There are seats, Tapasi. Please sit down if you like. And when this was said, Digha Tapasi took a low seat and sat down at one side. Now, before we go further, who, who is this Nigantaha uh, Digha Tapasi? <laughs> who is this? So we need to do just a quick little bit of background. So the first thing you need to know is that in the world today, there is a major religious tradition that comes out of India known, normally people would call it Jainism, uh, Jainas or Jain, the Jain tradition. So there's this religion called Jainism. And at first blush, 
it's very similar to Buddhism. They use a lot of the same language as Buddhism. It's deeply uh, about meditation. Now, the thing about it is, is that this religion that we call the Jain religion or the Jain tradition, it was around at the time of the Buddha. In fact, Jainism is even older than Buddhism. So in the Pali, so in these, the, which are Buddhist teachings, they're not Jain teachings, they're Buddhist teachings. And the only thing you really need to know for tonight is that in the world of Buddhism, they refer to Jains as Nigantahas. And a Nigantaha is, it basically means one free of bondage or free of ties, something along, along those lines. Now, at the time of the Buddha, the leader, the head of the Jains, meaning the Nigantahas, is a Nigantaha named Nataputta. But that's in the Buddhist text that he's known as Nataputta, the child of Nata. But you, if you've studied any kind of world religions, the leader of the Jains at the time of the Buddha is somebody normally called Mahavira. So this Nataputta or the Nigantaha Nataputta is Mahavira, like the leader of the Jains. <laughs> and one of his disciples is this guy, Digha Tapasi. Now, just really quickly, Digha means tall or big, broad, or long. And Tapasi is actually a title. So what you need to know really quickly is that if you're doing ascetic practice, and what I mean is you're, you're fasting, you're doing a lot of meditation, you're practicing a lot of focused concentration, well, that type of ascetic practice is said to build up a lot of tapas. And tapas means heat. It's kind of like a internal fire. You can think of it that way for now. And so somebody who cultivates tapas is a tapasi. And so a digha tapasi, it means like somebody who's been at the hard work of asceticism for a long time. So I just want to tell you that digha tapasi is sort of a it speaks more to this person's accomplishments than it is his name in that way. Now, what we need to kind of know is one more thing, and that's where this sutta takes place. So you might have noticed that this sutta takes place somewhere called Nalanda. And at the time of the Buddha, as we're going to hear in this sutta, there were these competing groups of ascetics. Uh, I, you know, I don't know what word to use. Are these religious sects? But there was the Buddhists, there was the Jains, and there were others. And Nalanda was like a, a hot spot for philosophical debate. And that's what's going to happen in our sutta tonight, is a grand philosophical debate in a way. And all I want you to know is, is that this, this, um, I don't even know what to call it, but this debating at Nalanda, it seems to have been a thing because as the years go on, Nalanda becomes a epicenter of Buddhist learning in India. And eventually Nalanda is the home of a giant Buddhist university where like hundreds of thousands of monks lived in dormitories people traveled from all over india from all over the world which is what makes it kind of a university and people studied buddhism but this is long after the buddha passed away and what we're going to hear about tonight is sort of how nalanda came to be a buddhist epicenter so 
This is going to center around a debate, a grand debate between the Buddhists and the Jains. And the topic of the debate is about to be introduced. So, oh, and by the way, actually, before I even mention that, I've already misspoken. The debate hasn't happened yet. And what I mean is, is that later on in the sutta, what, what's about to happen, it's just called a conversation. And it's important. Hi, Ed. It's important to remember that this is just a conversation. All right. It, it becomes a debate later on. All right. Ed, do you want to, you have a question? Oh, Ed, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought you were just saying hello. Uh, is Hi, I how are you, there Michael? You Hi, Ed. See you. Great to um, see you. Yeah. What page are you on? Because I have that book. I could awesome. 477. Thank you. Thanks for asking for others as well. Awesome. So let's see what the topic is. So, you know, after their little nice talk, Tapasi takes a seat. So then the Blessed One, and it's interesting to notice that it's the Buddha who asks first. So the Buddha, the Blessed One, asks, Tapasi, how many kinds of kama or karma, how many kinds of action does the Niganta Nataputta, Mahavira, how many kinds of action does the Niganta Nataputta describe for the performance of evil karma, bad evil karma, for the perpetration of evil karma? Friend Gotama, Tap Tapasi replies. The Niganta Nataputta is not accustomed to using the description karma or action, action. The Nigantaha Nataputta is accustomed to using the description danda, danda, rod, rod. Now, let's actually, let's talk about that for a moment. It's important to the whole debate or the conversation. So this Jain tradition that I was mentioning that's as old as Buddhism, actually older. It's a lot like Buddhism in a lot of ways, but it diverges from Buddhism in one major way. And we're about to read about that or hear about that. So the Jain tradition, at least the Jain tradition, according to the Buddhists, as it was being practiced in 500 BC, the Buddhists represent the Jains as talking about the rods, the three rods. And as we're, uh, we're going to hear in a moment, it's the, the danda, the rod of the body, speech, and the mind. And the reason why the Jains refer to this as a rod rather than action, which is what the Buddha is going to say, it's karma, it's action. Well, we have to understand that the basic philosophy of Jainism is that all karma, all, I'm sorry, all action is bad. All of it. You are a destroyer. <laughs> you destroy when you walk. You destroy when you talk. You destroy as you think. You're a destroyer. And it would. this is the Jain tradition. And so the best thing that you could do would be to not move, not talk, breathe as little as possible, and ultimately not think. Now, the reason why the Jains are so interested in destruction is because they are very, very sensitive to the, to the destruction of life. And that basically, as you're breathing, you're killing microorganisms all the time. In fact, every time you walk, 
you're crushing microorganisms all the time. And the Jain tradition is really sensitive to that. So much so that they consider all activity to be a lesson. And what I'm doing is, is I'm kind of deconstructing the atom or the, I'm deconstructing the meaning of rod. So you need to know that the, the meaning of a rod is that basically a teacher would hold the rod. And if you got the answer wrong, you got hit with the rod. It was a, it was a form of discipline. Well, basically the Jains, according to the Buddhists, they view all activity as a lesson and you're getting with everything that you do. And the most important thing from the, the conversation that's about to happen is that ultimately the Jains believe that the mind is just an observer and that all of the actual karma by which I mean activity is ultimately being performed by the body. So the heavy emphasis is on the body. So if at any point anybody has questions, of course, feel free to ask. But I do want you to know that I don't want to get too deep into the whole Jain philosophy because it's not really what this sutta is about. So let's, get, you know, when the debate happens, if there's still questions, please let me know. So the Nigantha, um, Tapasi says, yeah, we, we don't use the language of karma. We don't use the language of action because we don't believe we have agency. <laughs> what we believe is that we're being punished for our actions. So we call them rods. Now, the first thing that I love about this sutta is I want you to notice what the Buddha says in response to that. He says, uh, so then Tapasi, how many kinds of rod does the Nigantha Nataputta describe for the performance of evil action, for the perpetration of evil action? So the way that I read that is the Buddha says, okay, let's go with rod. <laughs> sure, let's go with rod. How many kinds of rod do you guys think there are in terms of evil action? So I love that the Buddha just rolls with the language that the Niganthas use. He's not making any arguments. He's like, yeah, okay, let's go with that. How many kinds of rods are there? Friend Gautama, the Nigantaha Nataputta describes three kinds of rod for the performance of evil action, for the perpetration of evil. That is the bodily rod, the verbal rod, and the mental rod. The Buddha asks, how then, Tapasi, is the bodily rod one, the verbal rod one, and the mental rod still another one? The Tapasi replies, the bodily rod is one, friend Gotama. The verbal rod is one, and the mental rod is still another. So that little part, by the way, it's not really clear exactly what was being said. And you, you encounter these phrases or these sentences in suttas often. My feeling about it, this is just my specu speculation, but my feeling about a line like that is that Tapasi was probably being demonstrative. And what I mean by demonstrative is he was probably saying, well, the body is one, the voice is another, and the mind is another. That's my understanding of what was going on there. But regardless, the Buddha asks, of these three kinds of rod tapasi, Thus analyzed and distinguished, which kind of rod does the Niganta Nataputta describe as the most reprehensible for the performance of evil action, for the perpetration of evil action? The bodily rod, 
the verbal rod or the mental rod? Of these three kinds of rod, friend Gotama, thus analyzed and distinguished, the Niganta Nataputta describes the bodily rod as the most reprehensible for the performance of evil action, for the perpetration of evil action, and not so much the verbal rod and the mental rod. Do you say the kaya danda? Do you say the bodily rod, tapasi? I say the bodily rod, friend Gautama. Do you say the bodily rod? I say the bodily rod. You're saying the bodily rod. <laughs> I say the bodily rod, friend Gautama. Thus the Blessed One made the Niganta Dika Tapasi maintain his statement up to three times. Then the Niganta Dika Tapasi asked the Blessed One, And you, friend? And you, friend Gautama? How many kinds of rod do you describe for the performance of evil? for the perpetration of evil. Tapasi, the Tathagata, is not accustomed to use the description dandam dandanti, or dan or rad rad. The Tathagata is accustomed to using the description karma karma, action action. But friend Gautama, how many kinds of action do you describe for the performance of evil? Tapasi, I describe three kinds of action for the performance of evil. That is, bodily karma, vocal karma, and mental karma, or action. How then, friend Gautama, is bodily action one, verbal action another, and mental action still another? Bodily action is one, Tapasi, verbal action is another, and mental action is still yet another. And of these three kinds of action, friend Gautama, thus analyzed and distinguished, which kind of action do you describe as the most reprehensible for the performance of evil, for the perpetration of evil, bodily, verbal, or mental? Of these three kinds of karma, of these three kinds of action, Tapasi, thus analyzed and distinguished, I describe Mano karma, mind karma, as the most reprehensible for the performance of evil, for the perpetration of evil. And not so much bodily and vocal karma. Do you say mano karma, friend Gautama? Do you say mental action? I say mental action. Do you say mental action? I say mental action. You're saying it's mental action. <laughs> yes, I'm saying it's mental action. Thus, the Niganta Dika Tapasi made the Blessed One maintain his statement up to th the third time, after which he rose from his seat and then went back to his teacher, the Niganta Nataputta. All right, so I, I kind of break this sutta into four parts. That's the end of part one. The one thing that I kind of want to draw our attention to, though, is that this is a very interesting debate. Which has priority? The physical or the mental? And I know that they're just talking about the, the perpetration of evil, like that idea, but you can actually go much, much deeper into the philosophy that's being spoken about here. And what I mean is, is that what is called the mind-body problem in Western philosophy, meaning the exact relationship between mental activity and physical activity, that relationship is still a very, very hotly debated topic. Meaning even today, <laughs> The great minds of the world are debating about which has priority, the mental or the physical. And I want you to kind of understand that as the debate rages on today, it was going on back then in terms of which was, again, which is sort of, I don't want to say more important, but that idea of priority, like 
Like without that, you don't have the other one. Allow me to kind of go one step deeper on that. It's this idea at a deeper philosophical level. It's the question about whether mental activity is just a weird byproduct of the physical world. So the physical is what matters, has priority. And the mental is just some sort of like weird biochemical electrical reaction. Or the mind has priority and all of this, these ideas of the physical, these ideas of the mental, all of these are just ideas. In other words, the mind has priority. Well, the Jains hold, held, they probably still hold, that the physical has priority. And the Buddha just said, as far as I teach, the mano, the mind, has the priority. All right, questions about any of that? All right, because it's about to get really good. <clears throat> Now, because we haven't even met Upali yet. Now, on that occasion, the Nigantaha Nataputta was seated together with a large assembly of householder laymen from Balaka, which is a town. And that group was headed by Upali. The Niganta Nataputta saw the Niganta Dighatapasi coming in the distance and he asked him, Now, where are you coming from in the middle of the day, Tapasi? I'm coming from the presence of the recluse Gautama, venerable sir. Did you have some conversation with the recluse Gautama, Tapasi? I had some conversation with the recluse Gautama, venerable sir. What was your conversation with him like, Tapasi? Then the Nigantha Dika Tapasi related to the Nigantha Nataputta his entire conversation with the Blessed One. When this was said, the Nigantha Nataputta told him, Good, good, Tapasi. The Nigantha Dika Tapasi has answered the recluse Gotama like a well taught disciple who understands his teacher's dispensation correctly. What does the trivial mental rod count for in comparison with the gross bodily rod? On the contrary, the bodily rod is the most reprehensible for the performance of evil, for the perpetration of evil, and not so much the verbal rod or the bodily rod or the mental rod. When this was said, the householder Upali said to the Nigantha Nataputta, Good, good, venerable sir. On the part of Digha Tapasi, the venerable Tapasi has answer, answered the recluse Gautama like a well-taught disciple who understands his teacher's dispensation correctly. What does the trivial mental rod count for in comparison with the gross bodily rod? On the contrary, the bodily rod is most reprehensible per the, for, per the performance of evil. Now, now check this out. Upali says, Now, venerable sir, I shall go and refute the recluse Gautama's uh, doctrine on the basis of this statement. If the recluse Gautama maintains before me what the venerable Dika Tapasi made him maintain, then just as a strong man might seize a long-haired ram by the hair, and drag him to and fro, and drag him all about. So in debate, I will drag the recluse Gautama too, and I shall drag him fro, and I shall drag him all about. Just as a strong brewer's workman might throw a big brewer's sieve into a deep water tank, and taking it by the corners might drag it to and fro, I, too, will drag the recluse Gotama to and fro. And then there's a couple more analogies, but one of my favorites is, and just as a 60-year-old elephant might plunge into a deep pond and enjoy playing the game of hemp washing, so I shall enjoy playing the game of hemp washing with the recluse Gautama. Venerable sir, 
I shall go and refute the recluse Gautama's doctrine on the basis of this statement. Now, this is uh, Nataputta, the leader. Go, householder, and refute the recluse Gautama's doctrine on the basis of this statement. For either I should refute the recluse Gautama's doctrine, or else the Nigantha Dika Tapasi, or you, yourself. One of us has got to do it. I don't know why one of us has to go do it. I think that's what the Buddhist position is. But the Jains want to debate. And in particular, Upali's fired up to go debate him. Now, I'm on section eight. Now, when this was said, the Nigantha Digha Tapasi, he said to the Nigantha Nataputta, Venerable sir, I do not agree that the householder Upali should try to refute the recluse Gautama's doctrine. For the recluse Gautama, <laughs> sorry, I lost my spot. For the recluse Gautama is a magician and knows a converting magic by which he converts disciples of other sects. <gasps> it's impossible, Tapasi. It can't happen that the householder Upali should go over to the discipleship under the recluse Gautama. But it is possible. It can happen that the recluse Gautama might come over to discipleship under the householder Upali. <laughs> Go, householder, and refute the recluse Gautama's doctrine. For either I should refute the recluse Gautama's doctrine, or else the Nigantha Tapasi, or you yourself. But for a second time, and a third time, the Nigantha Digha Tapasi said to the Nikantha Nataputta, Venerable sir, I don't agree that the householder Upali should debate the recluse Gautama, for the recluse Gautama is a magician and knows a converting magic by which he converts the disciples of other sects. It's impossible, Tapasi. It can't happen that the householder would get converted by the recluse, and it all gets repeated. Somebody's got to go do it. And then Upali says, yes, venerable sir, the householder Upali replied, and he rose from his seat, and after paying homage to the Niganta Nataputta, keeping him on his right side, he left to go to see the Blessed One in Pavarika's mango grove. All right. Part three. There, in the mango grove, after paying homage to the Blessed One, Upali sat down at one side and he asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, did the Nigantaha uh, Dikha Tapasi come here? The Nigantha Dikha Tapasi came here, householder. Venerable Sir, did you have uh, some conversation with him? I had some conversation with him, householder. What was your conversation with him like? And then the Blessed One related to the householder Upali his entire conversation with Tapasi. When this was said, the householder Upali said to the Blessed One, Good, good, venerable sir, on the part of Tapasi. The Nigantaha Digha Tapasi has answered the Blessed One like a well-taught disciple who understands his teacher's dispensation correctly. What is the trivial mental rod count for in comparison with the gross bodily rod. On the contrary, the bodily rod is the most reprehensible for the performance of evil, and not so much the verbal and the mental rod. The Buddha said, Householder, if you will debate on the basis of truth, we might have some conversation about this. I will debate on the basis of truth, venerable sir. So let us have some conversation about this. The Buddha said, what do you think, householder? Let's say over here there's some nigantaha who's afflicted, suffering, 
and gravely ill with an illness needing treatment by cold water, which is prohibited by the vows of a Jain to drink cold water. This is a big part of their religion, is to avoid taking baths in cold water, to avoid drinking cold water. They have something against cold water. So the Buddha says to him, suppose there's one of you guys, a nigantaha, who's deeply sick, gravely ill with a sickness that can only be treated by cold water. And that Jain, that nigantaha, might refuse cold water, except mentally he longs for it. And he uses only the permissible hot water, thus keeping his vows both verbally and bodily. Because he does not get the cold water, he might die. Now, householder, where would the Niganta Nataputta describe such a person's rebirth as taking place? Upali replies, Venerable Sir, there are gods called mind bound. That Nigantaha, he would be reborn there. And why is that? Because when he died, he was still bound by the attachment of the mind. <gasps> Householder! Householder! Pay attention to how you reply. What you just said, what you said afterwards, doesn't agree with what you said before. Nor does what you said before agree with what you just said now afterwards. Yet you made this statement. You said, I'll debate on the basis of truth, venerable sir. So let us have some conversation about this. And Upali replies, Venerable sir, although the Blessed One has spoken thus, yet the bodily rod is still the most reprehensible for the performance of evil action, for the perpetration of evil, and not so much the verbal and the mental rod. So it would seem that Upali isn't convinced. But I do want you to know, just for the sake of tonight's reading, I want you to know that at towards the end of the sutta, Upali says, you had me at hello. He, he tells him, you had me at this first one. I just wanted to hear you. I wanted to hear more, is what he says. So I just want you to know that that first one alone convinces Upali that the Buddha is right. That even according to the Jains, even according to the Nigantahas, the mental rod, if you haven't dealt with that, it's still going to keep you trapped. So the Buddha saying, even according to your own teachings, you're saying the mental rod is like, has the priority. And that's when he says, ah, uh -uh, be careful. What you just said contradicted what you said before and so on. So in that sense, the debate's over. It didn't last very long. And basically this Buddhist teaching that the mental activity is dominant over the body is, is in that sense, victorious, that, that position. I want to read a couple of more of these, though, just to get a, a grasp of what sort of the debate is. There's several more. I'm going to skip a couple for time's sake. So the next one... He says, this is the Buddha. He says to Upali, Upali, what do you think? What do you think, householder? Let's say there's a nigantaha. So here, some nigantaha might be fully restrained. All four curbs. And we don't need to get into it. It's just a Jain teaching about moral uh, restraint. So let's say that there's a nigantaha that is restrained in all four ways, all four checks, curved by all four curves, clamped by all four curves, cleansed by all the curves, claimed by all the curves. And yet, when going forward and returning, he brings about the destruction of many small living beings. What result does the Nigantaha Nataputta describe for that person? 
Venerable sir, the Nigantaha Nataputta does not describe what is unintended as being greatly reprehensible. But if one intends it, householder, oh, then it's greatly reprehensible, venerable sir. But wait a minute, Upali. Under which of the three rods does your teacher, the Niganta Nataputta, describe chatana, volition? Under the mental rod, venerable sir. <gasps> householder, householder, pay attention to how you're replying. What you said afterwards doesn't agree with what you said before, nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. But you told, you made the statement that we were going to do this based on truth. So let's have some conversation about this. All right, so for a second time, yeah, so for a second time, the Buddha uses the Nigantaha's teachings. He's not using the Buddhist teachings. He's using the Nigantaha's own teachings in pointing out the contradiction in saying, but you guys even teach that it's more reprehensible if somebody intends to kill some a creature than if they do it unintentionally. So you're already, you're saying it, it is more reprehensible based upon the mental. So again, at this point, Upali is fully convinced. There's a couple of more examples. There's one like, suppose somebody showed up to Nalanda and in, in, in their thoughts, they are like, I'm going to kill everybody in Nalanda. <laughs> and so they kind of have these wild descriptions. And again, I don't want to get too into them because there's much more to come. But basically, the Buddha gives those uh, gives two more examples, uh, one about the city of Nalanda, everybody in it being killed, and another about uh, these old forests that are the result of yogis' evil actions. We're not going to get into all of that. Upali's convinced. In fact, if you jump down to paragraph 15, Upali says, Venerable sir, I was satisfied and pleased by the Blessed One's very first simile. Nevertheless, I thought I would oppose the Blessed One thus, since I desired to hear the Blessed One's varied solutions to the problem. Magnificent, Venerable Sir! Magnificent! The Blessed One has made the Dharma clear in many ways, as though he was turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyes to see. Venerable sir, I go to the blessed one for refuge and to the Dharma and the Sangha of bhikkhus. Let the blessed one remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. So Upali is converted. But then the Buddha says, Investigate thoroughly, householder. It is good for such a well-known person like yourself. Sorry, it is good for such well-known people like you to investigate thoroughly. Venerable sir, I am even more satisfied and pleased with the Blessed One for telling me that. For the other sectarians, on acquiring me as their disciple, they would carry around a banner all over Nalanda announcing the householder Upali has come to, dis to disciplineship under us. But on the contrary, the Blessed One tells me to investigate thoroughly, householder. It is good for such well-known people like you to investigate thoroughly. So for the second time, Venerable Sir, I go to the Blessed One for refuge and to the Dharma and to the Sangha of bhikkhus. Let the Blessed One remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. And then the Buddha says this, Householder, your family has long supported the Nigantas, and you should consider that alms should still be given to them when they come. Venerable sir, 
I'm even more satisfied and pleased with the Blessed One for telling me that. Venerable Sir, I've heard that the recluse Gotama says this, gifts should be given only to me, gifts should not be given to others. Gifts should be given only to my disciples. Gifts should not be given to other disciples. Only what is given to me is fruitful, not what is given to others. Only what is given to my disciples is fruitful, not what is given to others. But on the contrary, the Blessed One encourage me, encourages me to give gifts to the Niganthas. Anyway, we shall know the time for that, Venerable Sir. So for the third time, Venerable Sir, I go to the Blessed One for refuge and to the Dharma and the Sangha of Bhikkhus. Let the Blessed One remember me as a lay follower who has gone forth to him for refuge for life. But then it gets even deeper. Now that Upali's on board, then the Blessed One gave the householder Upali progressive instruction. That is, he gave him a talk on dana, on giving, a talk on shila, moral virtue, and a talk on the heavens, which I understand to mean either the heavenly abodes of meditation or heavenly abodes of rebirth for doing good. The Buddha explained the danger, degradation, and defilement in sensual pleasures and the blessing of renunciation. And then when he knew the householder Upali's mind was ready, receptive, free of any hindrances, elated and confident, he expounded to him the teaching special to the Buddhas, the Four Noble Truths, the noble truth of suffering, its origin, its cessation, and the path leading to its cessation. Just as a clean cloth with all marks removed would take dye evenly, so too, while the householder Upali sat there, the spotless, immaculate vision of the Dharma arose in him. All that's subject, sorry, all that's subject to arising is subject to cessation. Then the householder Upali saw the Dharma, attained the Dharma, understood the Dharma, fathomed the Dharma. He crossed beyond all doubt, did away with perplexity, gained intrepidity, and became independent of others in the teacher's dispensation. Then he said to the Blessed One, now, venerable sir, we must go. We are busy and have much to do. You may go, householder, the Buddha said, at your convenience. All right. Everybody doing good out there? Sweet. Part four. Then the householder Upali having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, rose from his seat, and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right, he left to return to his own house. There, he addressed the doorkeeper thus. Good doorkeeper, from today on, I close my door to the Niganthahas, and the Niganthahis, the female Janes. And I open my door to the Blessed Ones, Bhikshus and Bhikshunis, uh, male lay followers and female lay followers. If any Niganthaha comes, tell him this. Wait, Venerable Sir, do not enter. From today on, the householder Upali has gone over to discipleship under the recluse Gautama. He has closed his door to the Nigantahas and Nigantahis, and he has opened it to the Blessed Ones Bhikshus, Bhikshunis, Upasikas, and Upasikas. Venerable Sir, if you need alms, 
wait here. They will bring it to you here. And the doorkeeper said, yes, venerable sir. Now, it so happened that the Nigantaha Digha Tapasi, he heard. The householder Upali has gone over to discipleship under the recluse Gautama. Then he went to the Niganta Nataputta and he told him, Venerable sir, I've heard that the householder Upali's gone over to discipleship under the recluse Gautama. Gautama. That's impossible, Tapasi. It cannot happen that the householder Upali should go over to discipleship under the recluse Gautama. But it is possible. It can happen that the recluse Gautama might come over to discipleship under the householder Upali. A second and a third time, the Nigantaha Digatapasi told the Niganta Nataputta, Venerable sir, I've heard that Upali, the householder, has gone over to discipleship under the recluse Gautama. It's impossible, Tapasi. It can't happen. He repeats himself. Venerable sir. Shall I go and find out whether or not the householder Upali's gone over to discipleship under the recluse Gautama? Go, Tapasi, and find out whether or not he's gone over to discipleship under the recluse Gautama. Then the Nigantha Dika Tapasi went to the householder Upali's house. The doorkeeper saw him coming in the distance and he told him, Wait there, wait, venerable sir, don't enter. From today on, the householder Upali's gone over to discipleship under the recluse Gautama. He's closed his door to the Nigantahas and Nigantahis, and he's opened it to the Blessed Ones, Bhikshus, Bhikshunis, Upasikas, and Upasikas. Venerable Sir, if you need alms, you wait here. They will bring it to you here. I do, I do not need alms, friend, he said, and he turned back and went to the Niganta Nataputta and told him, Venerable sir, it's only too true that the householder Upali's gone over to discipleship under Gautama. Venerable sir, I did not get your consent when I told you. Venerable sir, I don't agree that the householder Upali should try to refute the recluse Gautama's doctrine. For the recluse Gautama is a magician, and he knows a converting magic by which he converts disciples of other sects. In other words, I told you so, <laughs> right? And now, venerable sir, your householder Upali has been converted by the recluse Gautama with his converting magic. It's impossible, Tapasi. It can't happen that the householder Upalis should go to discipleship under the recluse Gautama. But it's possible that Gautama could come under discipleship under Upali. A second and a third time, the Nigantha Dika Tapasi told the Nigantaha Nataputta about Upali going under discipleship under Gautama. And Nigantaha Nataputta says three times, it's impossible, it's impossible. And then he says, now I shall go myself and find out whether or not he has gone over to discipleship under the recluse Gautama. Then the Nigantaha Nat Nataputta went with a large assembly of Nigantahas to the householder Upali's house. The doorkeeper saw them all coming in the distance, and he told him, Wait here, venerable sir. Do not enter. From today on, the householder Upali's gone over to discipleship under Gautama. He's closed his door to the Nigantas and opened it to the Bhikshus. Venerable sir, if you need alms, wait here. They'll bring it to you here. Good doorkeeper! Go to the householder Upali, and you tell him, Venerable sir, the Nigantaha Nataputta is standing at the outer gate with a large assembly of Nigantahas. He wishes to see you. Yes, venerable sir, he replied. And he went to the householder Upala, Upali and he told him, Venerable sir, the Nigantaha Nataputta is standing at the outer gate with a large assembly of Nigantahas and he wishes to see you. In that case, good doorkeeper, 
make seats ready in the hall of the central door. So, you know, kind of like in the foyer, sort of in the, not all the way inside the house, but just kind of in the front. <laughs> yes, venerable sir, he replied. And after he made seats ready in the hall of the central door, he returned to the householder Upale and he told him, Venerable sir, the seats are made ready in the hall of the central door. You may come at your own convenience. Then the householder Upali went to the hall of the central door and sat down on the highest seat, or sat down on the highest, best, chief, most excellent seat there. Then he told the doorkeeper, now, good doorkeeper, go to the Niganta Nataputta and tell him, Venerable sir, the householder Upali says, enter, venerable sir, if you wish. Yes, venerable sir, he replied, and he went to the Niganta Nataputta and he told him, venerable sir, the householder Upali says, enter, venerable sir, if you wish. Then the Niganta Nataputta went with the large assembly of Nigantahas to the hall of the central door. Now, previously, when the householder Upali saw the Niganta Nataputta coming in the distant, distance, he used to go out to meet him personally, dust off the highest, best, chief, most excellent seat there was with an upper robe, and having arranged it all around, have him seated on it. But now, while seated himself on the highest, best chief, most excellent seat. Upali told the Niganta Nataputta, Venerable sirs, there are seats. Sit down if you wish. When this was said, the Niganta Nataputta said, Householder, are you mad? <laughs> You're an imbecile. You went saying, Venerable sir, I shall refute the recluse Gautama's doctrine, and you've come back caught by the vast net of his doctrine. Just as if a man went to castrate someone and came back castrated himself. Just as if a man went to put out someone's eye and came back with his own eyes put out. So you too, householder, you went saying, Venerable sir, I shall refute the recluse Gotama's doctrine, and you come back caught by the vast net of his doctrine. Householder, you've been reconverted by the recluse Gotama's with his converting magic. <gasps> Auspicious is that converting magic, venerable sir. Good is that converting magic. Venerable sir, if my beloved kinsmen and my relatives were to be converted by this conversion magic, it would lead to the welfare and happiness of my beloved kinsmen and relatives for a long time. If all nobles were to be converted by this conversion, it would lead to the welfare and happiness of nobles for a long time. If all Brahmins, if all merchants, if all workers were to be converted by this conversion, it would lead to the welfare and happiness of all Brahmins, merchants, and workers for a long time. If the world with its gods, Maras, and its Brahma gods, this generation with its recluses and Brahmins, its princes, and its people, if they were to all be converted by this conversion, it would lead to the welfare and happiness of the world for a long time. As to this, venerable sir, I shall give you a simile. For some wise, understand the meaning of a statement by similes. All right. So since we have time, I'll read the simile. It's a little complicated. Venerable sir, 
There was once a Brahmin priest who was old, aged, and burdened with years. And he had, as a wife, a young Brahmin girl who was pregnant and near her confinement, near giving birth. Then she told him, Go, Brahmin, buy a young monkey in the market and bring it back to me as a playmate for my child. The Brahmin priest replied, Wait, madam, till you have born, till you have given birth to the child. If you have a boy, then I'll go to the market and buy a young male monkey and bring it back to you as a playmate for your little boy. But if you bear a girl, then I will go to the market and buy a young female monkey and bring it back to you as a playmate for your little girl. For the second time, she made the same request and received the same answer. For the third time, she made the same request. Then, since his mind was bound to her with love, the Brahmin, he went to the marketplace and bought a young male monkey, brought it back and told her, I have bought this young male monkey in the market and brought it back to you as a playmate for your young child. Then she told him, Go, Brahmin, take this young male monkey to Ratapani, the dyer's son, and tell him, Good Ratapani, I want this young male monkey dyed the color called yellow unguent, pounded and repounded and smoothed out on both sides. Then, since his mind was bound to her with love, he took the young male monkey to Ratnapani the dyer's son and told him, Good Ratnapata, Ratapani, I want this young male monkey dyed the color yellow, pounded and repounded and smoothed out on both sides. Ratapani the dyer's son told him, Venerable sir, this young male monkey will take a dyeing, but not a pounding or a smoothing out. So too, venerable sir, the doctrine of the foolish Nigantahas will give delight to fools, but not to the wise, and it will not withstand, not withstand testing and being smoothed out. Then, venerable sir, on another occasion, the Brahmin took a pair of new garments to Ratapani the dyer son and told him, Good Ratapani, I want this pair of new garments dyed the color called yellow unguent, pounded and repounded and smoothed out on both sides. Ratapani the dyer son told him, Venerable sir, this pair of new garments will take a dyeing and a pounding and a smoothing out. So too, venerable sir, the doctrine of the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, will give delight to the wise, but not to fools, and it will withstand testing and being smoothed out. Householder, the assembly and the king know you thus. The householder Upali is a disciple of the Niganta Nataputta, Whose disciple should we consider you to be? When this was said, the householder Upali rose from his seat and arranging his upper robe on one shoulder, he extended his hands in reverential salutation in the direction of the Blessed One and told the Nigantaha Nataputta, In that case, venerable sir, listen to whose disciple I am. He is the wise one who has cast off delusion, abandoned the heart's wilderness, victor in battle. He knows no anguish, is perfectly even-minded, mature in virtue, of excellent wisdom, beyond all temptations. He is without stain. The blessed one is he, and I am his disciple. Free from perplexity, he abides content, spurning worldly gain, a vessel of gladness, a human being who has done the recluse's duty, a man who bears his final body. He is utterly peerless and utterly spotless. The blessed one is he, and I am his disciple. He's free from doubt and skillful, the discipliner and excellent leader. None can surpass his resplendent qualities. Without hesitation, 
he is the illuminator. Having severed all conceit, he is the hero. The blessed one is he, and I am his disciple. The leader of the herd, he cannot be measured. His depths are unfathomed. He attained to the silence. Provider of safety, possessor of knowledge, he stands in the Dharma, inwardly restrained, having overcome all bondage. He's liberated. The blessed one is he, and I am his disciple. The immaculate tusker, living in remoteness, with fetters all shattered, fully freed, skilled in discussion, imbued with wisdom, his banner of conceit lowered. He no longer lusts, having tamed himself. He no more proliferates mental ideas. The blessed one is he, and I am his disciple. The best of seers, with no deceptive schemes, gained the triple knowledge, attained to holiness, his heart cleansed, a master of discourse. He lives ever tranquil, the finder of knowledge, the first of all givers. He is ever capable. The blessed one is he, and I am his disciple. He is the noble one, developed in mind, who has gained the goal and expounds the truth. Endowed with mindfulness and penetrative insight, he leans neither forwards nor back. Free from per perturbation, attained to mastery, the blessed one is he, and I am his disciple. He has fared rightly and abides in meditation, inwardly undefiled, in purity perfect. He is independent and altogether fearless, living secluded, attained to the summit. Having crossed over himself, he leads us across. The blessed one is he, and I am his disciple. Of supreme serenity, with extensive wisdom, a man of great wisdom, devoid of all greed, he is the Tathagata, he is the sublime one, the person unrivaled, the one without equal. He is intrepid, proficient in all. The blessed one is he, and I am his disciple. He severed all craving and become the enlightened one, cleared of all fumes, completely untainted, most worthy of gifts, most mighty of spirits, most perfect of persons, beyond estimation, the greatest in grandeur, attained to the peak of glory. The blessed one is he, and I am his disciple. When did you concoct that hymn of praise to the recluse Gotama householder? Venerable sir, suppose there was a great heap of many kinds of flowers, and then a clever garland maker or garland maker's apprentice were to knot them into a multicolored garland, so too, venerable sir, the blessed one has many praiseworthy qualities, many hundreds of praiseworthy qualities. Who, venerable sir, would not praise the praiseworthy? Then, since the Niganta Nataputta was unable to bear this honor done to the blessed one, hot blood then and there gushed from his mouth. <laughs> Svaha. That's the end of the sutta. All right. So, excellent. We did the whole sutta. Let's back up. Any comments, questions, ideas, anything, any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, Noe, then Ed. Oh, Ed, then Noe. I don't mean to be stupid, but when they <laughs> say blood gushed from his mouth, does that mean he like cussed the guy out? That's how I read. That's how I read it, Ed. Oh, okay. Yeah, and a few of the commentaries make it sound like 
that's probably what it means is that he was just like you <laughs> right, okay i get it thank you yeah thanks for being I here i really enjoy this thank oh, you oh yay excellent uh noe oh any other comments questions ideas yeah lane that was great michael oh, thank yeah. you Except I think I just converted to Jainism. <laughs> it has, there's certain things about it. But if but well, humanity just, just should stop. I'm on board. <laughs> just stop. Yeah. In, in many ways, it's not that different than Buddhism in that regard. I mean, the general outlook in a way. So I would say it's uh, Buddhism is just not as extreme. Yeah. Questions, ideas, comments, answers. I I had sort of a comment, and yeah, yeah. I'm new to new to a lot of this, but um, it strikes me that having um karma or comma you know manifest in a physical way is how a lot of people in general society you know without a lot of um you know deeper experience of Buddhism they sort of imagine that you will get hit by a bodily rod, you know, like that karma will be <laughs> manifest bodily. And that's kind of the, like, I always thought of that as sort of the preschool notion of karma. Um, but this, this is that is, am, am I thinking about this correctly that maybe that's sort of what they're arguing about? Um, or that might be too, that might be sort of a preschool notion of what they're sure. arguing about as well. I don't know. Yeah, man. Um, so I definitely, I will say, I definitely think that like a lot of suttas, but especially this sutta, I don't think there's, you know, one way to read it. I actually think it's preserved because of how it can be read in so many different ways. So my point is, you know, I, I said at the beginning that you could read really deep into this as far as which has priority, the physical or the mental. But I like what, what you were saying. And it's because I and I was thinking the same thing maybe earlier this morning. There is a way of teaching morality and ethics in the world, which basically fully emphasizes the physical, where it's basically saying, you know, fantasize about stealing all you want, but don't actually do it. And like you're saying, there's you'll go to jail or you'll have an actual like repercussion. And there's a way in which, based upon your worldview, right, based upon your drishti, you might think that there's no harm in just thinking about it. And this is like serious stuff to think about <laughs> in terms of our own views. Do we allow ourselves to just sort of get away with thinking about it and we're saying but i'm not doing it well the buddha is saying that it's it starts there so that's the the root in that way so i i like what you're saying jason about or the way you're thinking yeah yeah thank you yeah i i really enjoyed it so oh awesome yeah. i never know when i'm gonna you know when i read a long one i'm like oh are they gonna like I mean, if people fall asleep, sometimes that can be good, <laughs> but I was a little worried. So thanks, Jason. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, Ed, another comment, question? Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I sorry to uh, disagree, but I think that he's going further than it starts there. I think he's solidly saying like living in um, resentment or living in greed or living in lust is the suffering. And I honestly don't know how, I mean, I get the thing about resentment, like what I just said, but um, like with, like greed can be um, really, really, really uncomfortable and envy and um and lust sexual um 
but um but I don't know how they become how they come from karma but I do know that they exist in your mind and you don't take action, but it still can like really screw you up. Mm -hmm. Like particularly the resentment one, even though the other stuff is really powerful too. So I would say like, I really, really, I mean, when those guys were saying like, I think that it's the body, the rod of the body you know, it's kind of the way it's written is I think it's the rod of the body because that's what my teacher says it is. <laughs> and that's kind of dumb. It, they so, were implying they were implying that Ed. Good good read. There, so, there was well, a subtle... thank you. <laughs> but no, I really. just I, I just think that the you know, the mind, you know, can can nosedive into a lot of really bad stuff. And I don't like, but okay, well, but how to say that that is karma? Like, how did I bring that upon myself? You know, mm -hmm. and I, I just, I don't know how that works, you know? Yep. So, yeah. But anyway, yep. that's like all I have to say. Yeah, Ed. A um, couple of things to mention about that. So, I hear you, Ed, that that um, it might be even more than just starting mental. It might be like that's the like that's all there is. And what I want to say to that, Ed, is as a lot of you know, because you've probably studied Dharma, you studied Buddhism before, you may know that as Buddhism develops and you know eventually kind of some forms of Buddhism become this Mahayana Buddhism. Well, as you know, and Ed, I, I know you know this, the philosophical basis of Mahayana Buddhism is what they call mind only. Meaning there isn't even actually the physical and you know vocal realms. Those are actually just <laughs> mental. So there is only the mental realm, making it all the more important to deal with in the way that you're talking about, Ed, or not deal with, but that the root causes are down there. But I have one more thing to tell you about, Ed. This, so this is a little, um, a little mini Dharma talk that is just going to be embedded right here. And it comes out of the sutta, but it's just a topic that it gets spoken about, I think, just twice. And what it is, it's in response to, or it's the, the Buddha's second simile to Upali that converts him. And remember, he was already converted with number one, but the second one is where they mention this idea of intention or volition. I believe the translation you we all have, it's volition. So... This is a really, really important Buddhist idea. And it's unfortunate that the translation is so tricky. So the word in Pali is Chetana, C-E-T-A-N-A, -E Chetana. And it is translated as volition or intention, but it, it's m way more interesting than all of that. So what it is, is it's the idea of, um, you can kind of imagine Chetana as the, this is a simile, this is just an upaya, but it's like the energy of a row of dominoes that are falling. So if you have a domino here and a domino here and it falls and hits this one and then there's another domino that hits that one and now there's a kind of momentum and I want you to think about the energy of that momentum and what I mean is, is, is it's that energy is not just in this domino, it's not just in this domino. It's not just in that domino, it's it's kind of in all of them and none of them. 
but there's the energy of the flow. So what Buddhism is basically talking about at a very fundamental level is, as you know, it's all about conditioning. And the basic idea is, is let's say, let's say my, let I'm just uh, hypothetically talking, by the way, but let's say that my go-to place when I get like sad or depressed or, you know, feeling down, I go to sugar. Let's just say, right? And so there's this kind of sort of way in which I start to feel down and I want a sundae, or I start to feel down and I want a donut. And the idea is, is that there's a pattern or a habitual pattern that starts to develop because who knows when this starts, right? It all kind of starts in childhood in that way, but there's a moment where a little bit of sadness or depression in childhood is alleviated momentarily, of course, by a sugar rush. And so I know this is cartoonish, but let's just say the very, very, very first time you felt sad, somebody gave you a lollipop and you were like, mm, and you got happy. The next time you get sad, what are you looking for? Sugar. And then you get you, ooh, a cookie. Ah, and I feel happy. So that's two times, that's two dominoes that have fallen in terms of responding to depression or sadness with sugar. And as the dominoes keep falling, meaning as you keep doing that, that is the chetana building up. Now, let's say you've been doing this for 40, 50 years. Let's just say you've been doing it that long. If all of a sudden I were to start to get a little sad or depressed, how much free will do I have in terms of my next move? And what I'm getting at is, is that my choice to go to the ice cream shop because I'm feeling down I know it feels like a choice. I know it feels like free will, but Buddhism is actually about looking deeper into what we're doing, saying, and thinking, and noticing conditioned habits underneath all of that, and realizing that there's a giant row of dominoes of your past actions behind you, and the dominoes have fallen, and then it's like sadness, sugar. And, and at that point, it's just a domino falling. There's no free will involved. Now, the problem, or not the problem, the answer is that we can uncondition ourselves, or if you like, you can recondition yourself in any which way you would like, actually. But the idea here is, is that you could, next time you get sad or depressed, rather than what can I consume, you could establish the habit of stopping and noticing that emotion and then looking a little deeper and kind of, well, why do I feel sad right now? So rather than alleviating it, ask yourself, why? Is it some ego-based problem? Is it some anger-based problem? Is it some lustful desire-based problem? Like, why am, oh, am I not getting what I wanted? The Buddha talked about not getting what you wanted and getting all sad and depressed from not getting what you wanted. Is that what's going on? But my point is, stopping and looking at the emotion that's arising is basically a way of stopping the dominoes from falling in that direction. Now, that's one time, one time you stopped. Rather than consuming, you stopped. But if you do it again, now you're starting a new pattern, a new chetana, 
a new volition or a new uh, intention in that way. So I just, that's my little Dharma talk on Chetana. The problem, in my opinion, with volition or intention is that for me in English, those words have a lot of agency involved in them. Uh, intention much more so than volition. Volition, we can work with volition, especially if you get into volver, right? That kind of um, the Romance language root volver, turning. Oh, now we're going, getting somewhere in that way. So anyways, I digress from my mini Dharma talk. Questions about any of that? The sutta, chetana, the dominoes. Cool. Then we did it and we did it. Excellent. Um, that's going to conclude our Upali Sutta then. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michael. Oh, my tremendous pleasure. I love reading suttas.